We're talking about, in our message series, a champion from challenges. Today is one of the most unlikely passages in my ministry career. I think I've preached one time. In 2018, I think I preached from this passage, and that's been a number of years ago. And I want to circle to this passage and let it speak to us today. And I want to say to you that as we're talking about uh, becoming a champion from challenges, this passage, as you go through it, is discouraging because it is the epic fail of Judah. It is his boundary lines, it is his temptation lines that he just blows right through. And his temptations may be very different than your temptations. And what he faced in his time of life may be very different than what you will face in your time of life. And today's message is not designed to peel back the scars of something that maybe you've experienced. But today is something to help us just think about the truth God is giving to us and say, from this day forward, Lord, let me live in the light you are showing me now. Let me live in the victory you have in mind for me right away. And let me walk in that light that you give me, that understanding. Let me walk in that so I might be able to live a life that is pleasing to you and bring a peace to my heart that surpasses any kind of peace that could be given to me by anything else that I might pursue. Now, if you leave this church and you go down Blue Mountain Drive and you continue down, eventually you're going to have the opportunity to come to a stoplight down the road. And when you come there, you can take a right and go on over into Walnutport. You can take a left, like you're going to head on into the Lehigh Valley. If you take that left, you're going to go over what many have called, and I think I'm calling it correctly, the Tricler Bridge. Anyway, it's that big bridge that is a four-lane bridge. Now, I want you to imagine just for a moment, if they took those concrete barriers out of the middle the risk that you would have when you met cars coming the other way. I want you to think about the sides of that bridge right now just for a minute. You have concrete barriers along the side, right? If you take those off the side, you probably would feel a little bit less safe crossing that river because there could be the possibility that you would just kind of doze a little bit or you might look at your phone or you might adjust your radio or you might have a blowout on your car tire and you would all of a sudden, <coughs> you would be flying off of that. Or take the trip over to Palmerton if we go just right here to the Cherryville Light and take a ride and now we're gonna take 248 and we take 248, we finally come to the gap and as we're going in the gap, we go over the other lane that is below us. Now just think if they took that concrete guardrail off the edge of that, when you're flying in the air, how risky that would be because if you fell off of that, you would either thud down on the other lane, go down toward the train track, or depending how fast you're driving, like, you know, like Pastor Scott or something, you might come around that curve and go flying off into the river thinking you had a boat. It would be bad. Or think about going into Lehigh and you come finally to the end of 248 there where you could go straight, you go down. No, we're not going that way. We're going to turn left. We're going to turn left and now we're going to go into, into Lehigh. And if you go across that bridge, that bridge is tight. Mm -hmm. That bridge is tight. When you have a semi coming the other way or a box truck, there's nothing to fool around with. And just think if you took the edges off of that where they had that nice concrete barrier that you might need in case somebody pushes against you and you slam against that, you're going to be really glad for that guardrail. Guardrails happen when we go around real tricky curves like that one over at, at, on the way to Palmerton. It happens when we come to places like the Tricler Bridge or when we go into a place like Lehighton. Those kind of guardrails are not there to hurt us. They're not there to do anything. They're there to keep the other traffic from hitting us head on and to keep us from hitting them head on. They're there to keep us from flying off the edges that we might damage, maybe go into a river or do something like that. Some of you enjoy the outdoors and you like to go, you like to go hiking. And you remember just a few years ago, some of you would like to go to Glen Onoco Falls, right? And you would go there and you would see the signs that would warn you about the conditions or about what might be there. And I was reading and study for this message this week, I was reading some of the news articles of people that went there, maybe they traveled from another country, and I was reading particularly about a lady who was in her 70s, she was 72 years old, and she was with a group of people and they were hiking there, and they were ignoring the conditions which were a little bit damp and slippery that day, and she slipped off there and she fell and she died. And I'm thinking how senseless that was. There were signs everywhere. The conditions were enough of a sign themselves. And all of this was a warning to her. They weren't there to make her life miserable. They weren't there to cause her sadness and say, look what I can do. They were there to say, hey, you want to live in victory? You want to have a life full? You want to be able to go back home? Just mind what these boundaries are talking about. Lisa Turkhurst 
whom I've quoted from from time to time, she said, boundaries aren't just a good idea. I like how she words it. They are a God idea. And then she cites how God created the sea and with all of its choppiness and all of its anger and roar and all of that, he put a boundary, a sand barrier around that so the sea knows how far to go. Tim Tebow, quarterback in the NFL, for some time, great college uh, Heisman Trophy winner. He's a great guy, right? He said this, not everything we say no to is wrong, bad, or sinful. It's just not the best choice to make. Decide your no's so you can choose your best yeses. I love how he put that. That is so good as a touchdown. Right there when he was talking about how that works. In our life, we greatly benefit from the guardrails that are around us. We benefit from the barriers that are set up to keep us from going certain places. But in, Ju in Genesis chapter 38, Judah had no real personal boundaries. He did not exercise any kind of restraint in his life. He was very, very much so a poor example of how to live your life. Such a contrast from the next chapter where Joseph would face all kinds of adversity and then great temptation, real temptation, salacious temptation. And Judah is an example of how not to follow through. So today I want to look at several of his actions and I want to follow his story. But I'm going to ask you not to tune me out. I'm going to ask you not to turn me off. I'm going to ask you to stay with me all the way to the end. Because we're not only going to look at some of the stuff that went bad, we're going to look at how God can redeem somebody who maybe has gone off the guardrail, gone off the deep end. You see, you don't have to be pristine to go to a church. You don't have to have your life all together to go to a church. You don't have to be all that, whatever that is. You don't have to be all that. I want to tell you there was only one person who did not sin while he lived on this earth, and his name was Jesus Christ. You have sinned, I have sinned, all God's people at some point in her life say, I wish I wouldn't have done whatever it was I did. So let's dig in. Look at verse 2 of chapter 38 of Genesis, and we see that Judah ignored God's boundaries early on. If you go back into chapter 37, verse 26, you see that he is Joseph's brother, and he was part of the crew that decided to sell Joseph into slavery. Human trafficking is a big thing today. Can you imagine selling off one of your siblings into human slavery, human trafficking. It brings it real. They got rid of him, not caring what happened to him. No care of whatever it would be. They sold it, and this is Judah. This is who he is. He moved into an area that was a pagan area, away from where God wanted him to live. He married a lady from that culture who was a pagan lady, not believing in God in any way. And God was not in favor of this. Judah had no personal boundaries. He said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live the way I want. I don't care what God says. I don't care what, what the patriarchs have said. I don't care what the Bible says. He says, I don't care anything about. And you know what? To top that off, something that I thought was very interesting in my study of this, he did not influence his wife Tamar toward God. She influenced him toward very much so her own false religions and the heathen way of living her life. And man, sometimes when young people are dating, say, oh, I'm just going to go get somebody. I'm so, I'm so focused to get somebody. And not just young people, but other people. And I cannot believe how somebody say, I'll marry somebody. I don't care if they believe in God. I'll bring them to church. I'll do it. Listen, to, you're not supposed to have this stuff of guyvation and galvation where you're on a missionary dating. You need to follow after what God has in mind for us. And this is what he is talking about right here early on in this passage right now. And maybe some of you today will look at your own life and say, I've ignored God's boundaries and the way he's led me in my life. Not just in that area, but in your business dealings or in your finances or in your health or in something else, and you say, I need, to, I need to follow what God is saying to me. Let's notice something else about Judah. Verses 7 through 12, I see that Judas exper uh, Judah experienced heavy grief. He has three sons. He has one, they call him Er, and he married Tamar. Now, when he married Tamar, it was displeasing to God and he displeases God in an ongoing way 
to where eventually God says, I've had enough, and he let Er die. Now, the Leverite law said that in that case, the next son in line was to take the oldest son's wife as his wife, have children that would be in the name of the oldest son. Different culture, different time period. That's where we are in the Bible at this point. Onan was a second son. And he said, I don't want to have a son for him. I don't want to do that. I don't want her as my wife. And God was displeased because God had set up that law and God took him out. So now we're down to the third son. His name was Shelah. I know a person named Sheila, but they pronounce this Shelah here. He's a young, but he's too young to marry. And being too young to marry, Judas says to Tamar, 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 I want you to return to your father. And when Sheila is old enough, I want you to come back and then I'll let you marry my youngest son. Now, this sounds like a movie straight out of Hollywood, doesn't it? I mean, this is just like, are you kidding me? This is what is happening right here with this. this. But <clears throat> whenever he grew older, old enough to marry, Judah did not follow through with this instruction. He did not follow through. And Tamar realized, well, he's not going to give me his son. And then something happened. In verse 12, we read that Judah's wife dies. And when Judah's wife died, it sent him into pain and grief that would have been unfamiliar to him before. He's experiencing the grief of his son's death. Now he's experiencing the grief of his wife's death. And he's facing all kinds of pain and all kinds of loss. I just want to tell you, pain and loss are inevitable in this world. We're going to have them from time to time. They're going to come. And we need to understand this will happen. So let's notice something else about him. Look at verse 12. Judah eventually moved forward in his life. He eventually moved forward in his life. Judah was advancing through grief. Now, all of us have gone through grief of some kind at some point in some way. And if you haven't yet, you will in your future go through it in some way. And healing is some sort of an option. It'll never be the same. It'll never feel quite the same. But God will provide some sort of healing. But in this case, as is the case when we have a major adjustment in our life, we become a shining target for Satan to come after us to do some kind of distraction or temptation. And Judah becomes a shining target. He has had two fresh graves with his son. Now he has his wife, and that is a fresh grave. And he's thinking, I want to do something fun. I want to do something good. So he says, well, they're shearing sheep down in Timnah, by verse 12. And he says, I'm going to go on down there. Now, the scripture would tell us about sheep shearing time in 2 Samuel, in 1 Samuel. It would say it would be kind of a party time. It would be a celebration time because you're going to have a lot of revenue come in because if it's been a good year with the wool, you're going to make a lot of money. You're going to get a lot of price and it's going to be a good time. New clothes, everything is going to be good. So he says, I tell you what, I'm going to go down. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to go see what's going on. And so he is headed off. <coughs> Excuse me. He's headed off on his way to Timnah. And as he goes down there, Tamar catches wind that he's going to take a trip down there. Now she's been wearing widow clothes. That's what they did as their custom. Whatever that was to her, I don't know, but she was wearing them. But she catches wind and she disguises herself, and she disguises herself in this case as a prostitute. And she sits along the road, and the scripture tells us this much about her outfit. She veiled her face. So he doesn't know who that is. You can't tell who's behind the, who's behind the veil. And in these moments right here, in the midst of his sorrow, she says, I'm going to sit here. She comes from a culture that does not honor or know God. She comes from a people that don't respect the Lord in the way that he would have been raised up. She doesn't value God. And Judah is out of town, without boundaries, in a party mood. And he was a shining target for the trap that was about to happen. A number of years ago, while I pastored over in Bethlehem, I was uh, at a men's breakfast on the morning. We had a guest preacher there from over in Bethlehem, a pastor from there. He had grown up in England, but he had moved to the United States, and he was a friend of our church and a friend of us, and he attended our ministerial. And so he came over to speak to us at our men's breakfast for the church. There was a good turnout and a good breakfast. Everybody was doing well. It came his turn to speak. 
He stood up to speak. His name was Harvey Copperwheat. Some of you may remember that name or would have known him. He was a friend of mine. Harvey's wife would take long trips and be gone for extended times, like several weeks at a time. And uh, Harvey would stay back. And uh, so anyway, she, she was on one of those multi-week trips. And uh, he was there at our breakfast and he was teaching. And he came down through his conversation about his uh, whatever discussion he was having. And he said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be pretty well personal about it. He said, I'm going to just tell you that <clears throat> I had a, a lady classmate from back, I guess, in the homeland who had come over on a visit into the United States, found out where he was, looked him up, and, and met up with him. And when she met up with him, Harvey, who was wearing a, a big cast on his arm, said this. He said, I... I am grateful that my arm was in a cast. It kept the thoughts of something regrettable from happening with that lady. Sometimes our distractions and our things that look like they're a grand interruption in life may be a very thing that God is allowing us to experience to keep us from something stupid. Judah walked right on past every, every warning sign. And I notice next in verse 15, Judah walked right into the trap. He just walked right on into this trap. And you might look at some, some area of your own life and say, boy, I just walk into that trap so often. I just hate, hate that about myself. I wish I didn't do that. But you're walking into a trap. He saw Tamar along the side of the road, but he doesn't know it's Tamar. This is a lady sitting there with a veil. The temptation is, is hitting him. Man, alive, I haven't been with a woman for so long. I, my wife is dead. Man, I wish I had something. I wish I had, I wish I had that, that, that closeness. I wish I had that intimacy. And all of a sudden, every hormone in his body starts screaming for something to happen. And, and you, can just, you can just sense the chill in his hand and you can sense the stomach coming up like so and you can see, see the thoughts racing in his mind and he walks over and, and he talks to her. Now let me just say this. First thing I think that he did right here was he stopped. Second thing I think he did here was I think he looked. Third thing I think he did was I think he started thinking about it. And the next thing he did was he went over in, and engaged in what was going on. Dr. Henry Cloud is a phenomenal counselor and a Christian man. And he has written a lot of good books, and one of them is Boundaries for Leaders. And one of the things he talks about in there is this. We need to be ridiculously in charge of our boundaries, of our guardrails, of our moral decisions. We need to be ridiculously in charge of our time. We need to be able to say yes. We need to be able to say no. It's back to what Tim Tebow said. Decide on your no's so you can choose your best yeses. It's like uh, Turker said, there are boundaries that are good ideas and they're God ideas and God wants to help us with this kind of stuff. And Judah blew right past any kind of thought that he may have ever had that would have been a help to him in this moment. And so he allows himself to do stuff that would have been unthinkable and is crazy. And so he begins to negotiate for her services. It's a decision he didn't even flinch. But he would experience unwanted pain and unwanted torture in his own life because of this decision. He destroys any remote boundary that he has. He walks right into the trap that Tamar has. Look at verse 16 of your passage. Tamar asks a question that would haunt Judah the rest of his life. She says in verse 16, what will you give me for doing this? He still hadn't picked up. Maybe she disguised her voice too. Maybe it was muffled through the veil. I don't know. Verse 17, Judah said, I'll give you a young goat from my flock. What well, to you and me, that would seem like, are you kidding me? But in their culture, that was a big deal. Your wealth was measured in part by your livestock. And so she, she hears this. And it, Judah kind of thinks he deserves this, doesn't he? She asks a second question where she ratchets it up a little bit more. It's more specific. You see, he still could have done a U-turn, but he doesn't. Ju and look at verse 17. Will you give me something until you give me that goat? And whatever it is in your life or mine, we start thinking about, will you do this until you can whatever? And if we're not careful, we allow ourselves, we allow ourselves to begin to consider it. She says in verse 18, look at it of your passage, Genesis 38. She says, I would like your signet or your seal. I would like your cord and I would like your staff. In other words, this is a personal DNA of the time that they had 
and I would like for you to give that to me. And Judah was so overrun by hormones and so interested in what he was seeing and thinking about physical gratification and a moment with a lady. And he says, okay, I'll do it. He blew up his honor and his dignity. Look at verse 19. Afterwards, there's always an afterwards. If we could feel the afterwards as much as we feel the temptation, we probably wouldn't do half the stuff we do when we're tempted, would we? He felt the afterwards. Well, the afterwards comes after him. After Judah left, he goes his way. But Tamar, she changes her clothes back into the widow's clothes, the scripture says. Judah thought nothing more of it. Had a good moment, had a good time, five minutes, diverted my attention. I'm celebrating life. I'm going, he, he sends a lady on. And then he sends, look at verse 20. He sends one of his friends with a goat and says, I want you to go find that lady that's on the way down there to Timnah, uh, just alongside the road. You'll find her easy to spot. And he describes her, I guess. And so they take the goat and they look for her. Verse 20 through 22 the friend comes back and says, you know what? I look high and low. I ask people, I can't find that lady anywhere. She's nowhere to be found. Verse 23, Judah said, let the lady keep what she has. Well, what does she have? She's got his DNA, right? She's got his seal. That's his signet. That's a power of signing. Has his cord and has his staff. Let her keep what she has. We tried to find her. If we keep looking for her, the NIV says it this way, we will be a laughing stock. We're going to be a laughing stock. He hoped the ordeal is behind him. Not so fast. Now, look at this scripture that comes up on the screen here out of 1 Corinthians. The temptations in your life, fill in your name. The temptation in Kevin's life, Judy's life, John's life, Pam's life, fill in the blank, are no different. They may vary from person to person, but no different from what others experience. So people will come to you and they'll say, well, you've never heard of this. Well, you've heard of something close because it's happened. And God is faithful. So it goes right from that temptation, inserts a big, big off ramp. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. In other words, if you will choose your will If you will choose, you do not have to do this. If you're tracking with me, say amen. Amen. You don't have to do whatever this is in your life. Maybe different than Judah. When you are tempted, here's what you do. When this is happening, when the hormones are going, ah! Whenever you're about to sign the deal and you know it's not the right deal, ah! Whatever it is going on in your life. When When you are tempted... He will show you a way out so that you can endure. I don't say that as a hot dog. I simply am the ambassador saying that to you today and saying to you, I have leaned on that verse so much because I have needed that verse in my life so many times. I humbly simply present it to you today and say, we need that verse. Judah needed that one big time. He needed that big time. Well, you're listening so kindly. I want to keep going here just a little further. Look at verses 24 through 30. I just noticed here that Judah experienced public humiliation. Three months later, Judah learned that Tamar was expecting. Well, this was his daughter-in-law who was supposed to marry his third son. She had already been with the first one, the second one. Now she was going to be with the third one. And look at verse 24. He's told Tamar is guilty of prostitution. She is pregnant. Three months alone. Judah says in verse 24, without missing a beat, he says, well, bring her out and let's burn her. Different time period, different, different way of life. Bring her out, let's burn her. Oh my goodness, horrific. In other words, we got a long finger for something ultimately we did, right? And then she says something in verse 25 that is a game changer and it stops the clock. And straps his heart and his mouth goes dry. And he's all of a sudden like, oh, like he's been sucker punched. Have you read this scripture lately? If you haven't, let me read it for you. As Tamar was being brought out, she sent a messenger to Judah. I mean, she's on her way out to be burned, right? She sent out a messenger and said, um, 
I'm expecting a child by the man who owns these things. Would you see if you recognize them? What did she bring out? You guessed it. His signet, his cord, his staff. And the scripture says that Judah recognized them. He didn't try to deny. He didn't try to escape. He didn't try to pull one over on somebody. He wasn't trying to gaslight them. He says, look at verse 26. He says, she is more righteous than I, since I would not give her my son Shelah. Verse 27 through 30, look at it, it's very important. Tamar gave birth to twins, Perez and Zerah. Today you may find yourself in the crosshair of a very humbling reality. You may find yourself miserably sick from some decision that seemed very inviting at the time, but has brought to you a disastrous result. Does God have mercy? Does God have justice? Where does this all fall? Well, I want to, I want to land this, but I'm going to take just a moment or two landing it. So don't race. Don't, don't just close your notes or your Bible yet. I want you to know that God sees a bigger picture than you and I see. We generally see now God sees the past, the now, and the next. He sees a much bigger picture than we do. He sees things differently than some people around us do. They wanted to stone her. God says, now I've got a different path. So watch what happens here in this path. If you notice... The law in Deut Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10 says, Justice should prevail and she should be stoned, burned, killed, dead. They wanted to burn her. So he was right in interpreting the law. He was right in... But mercy said, how shall we repair this situation? What shall we do since we have this situation that has come up? What situation has come up in your life? A document you've signed? A place you've gone? A thing you've done? A word you have said, a text you have sent, an email you wish you could take back? Would there be anything? Well, look at the midterm. Look at the midterm. Judah is a broken man. The scripture says to us that he does not continue his relationship with Tamar. He doesn't take her as his wife. He doesn't take her as his girlfriend. He doesn't bring her on as his mistress. He never connects with her again in this way. He doesn't do that. If you read the next few chapters, as I did in study and prep for this message, even this week, I tell you what, as I was reading through the passages, I was literally getting chills thinking about the incredible way God wove this story. It was amazing. It is amazing. And I think you'll find it so. When the famine comes and Joseph is already second in line to Pharaoh and he's running Egypt, his brothers come to him. They have woolly beards because that's what they wore. They look like shepherds. The Egyptians despise shepherds and the Egyptians shave clean. Joseph was a young kid. Now he's an older guy. They don't even recognize him. And he demands that they go back and get their young brother and bring him back because they confess they have a younger brother. And who stands... It's in chapter 43. Who stands up to Joseph and gives one of the most heartfelt, epic speeches in all the Old Testament, Judah. This is later. This is after. This is time has passed. He has wised up from his foolish ways, from his foolish days. Something is happening in the heart of this guy to where he would step up and he'd say, no, sir, Please don't, please don't we, don't, we can't do this. Our dad is going to die. By the time you reach chapter 44, he says, we cannot take me. Don't take my younger brother. Take me. He's falling on the sword for his family. His integrity and his questionable past is now behind him. He's starting to stand up. He's put boundaries in his heart and life. He gave his word to his father. I'll bring Benjamin back to you. If I don't, I am forever indebted to you and you can kill all my family. He says, I will live by my word. Now he has boundaries. Now he has boundaries. He became responsible. 
And as Woodrow Kroll says, I echo, if you don't have boundaries today, if you don't have guardrails in your life today, let Judah be a lesson to you. You can put them in. What about the long term? I said God sees the long term as well. Go over to the Gospel of Matthew, please, in the New Testament. Matthew. Log on to your device, chapter 1, please. Let's go there. If you're in chapter 1 of Matthew, you're where I am and where our message now is. Let's read. Let me read here a few verses. Don't, don't bypass these first few words. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Perfect Jesus. Without fault, blame, or sin, Jesus. Son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers that lumped Joseph in, all them. Now listen. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Are you kidding me? I look at that and I'm thinking, you have got to be kidding. A prostitute? Judah? Joseph, I could understand. Judah? There's a reason. He models redemption. All the way back here. Go ahead and read about David. David begot Solomon. Who did he have Solomon with? Well, they go ahead and mention, honorably mention, he was the wife of Uriah. Bathsheba. He had an affair with her. Some of you may think you have, think you have to be perfect to come into a church. Let me tell you, come in here just as you are. This is not a license of sin. Grace is not to be, to be taken advantage of. But now go to the last book of your Bible, would you please? Revelation would be that book. Go on back to Revelation. And when you get to that last book, you're where I am and where our message is. Revelation chapter 5. In chapter 5, I love this. I don't usually lick my fingers, but my Bible is so tasty. <laughs> it is the bread of life. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. John the Revelator is writing this. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice that would thunder through heaven, he's saying, in other words, who is worthy to open the scroll or to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. So John says, I wept because no one was found worthy to open and read this scroll or even to look at it. But, I'm not going to have you say that, but there it is. But one of the elders said to me, well, what did he say? Do not weep. Well, why should I not weep? Behold the lion, the great one, the big one, the chosen one, the preferred one, the Messiah. That's what he's saying. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed and opened a scroll and loose its seven seals. Are you kidding me? Back here, I wouldn't have given a ghost of a chance for anything good to come from Judah at all. Did he blow it badly? Yes, he did. Would he live to regret it? A hundred percent. Was he sorry for what he did? Of course. Did he straighten up his ways? Yes. Is he mentioned in the who's who? Yes. And you know what I know? No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how perfect you think the rest of your life is, you've got that gap, you've got that gaff, you've got that regrettable. 
God offers you forgiveness today. He offers you boundaries. He offers you a hope. He offers you a future. And he wants you to take it. Max Lucado writes this about boundaries. I thought interesting. Not guardrails. He, he, he gives this prayer, and we, we close with this prayer today. Lord, I want to thank you for being the God who cares so much for each of us that you desire for us to be whole. And the boundaries you have designed lead to wholeness. Forgive us for the times we've resisted your boundaries and help us to receive your boundaries as truly life-giving. Grow in us the ability to trust you more and more, especially as we discover what it means to implement healthy boundaries in our lives. We're in awe of your amazing goodness, and we give you all of our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to bow your head now, if you would. Father, this message is meeting with a, with a gong across this Sunday morning. And we thank you that you did not omit this, what looks really like an interruption in the story of the superstar Joseph. But it keeps our feet very grounded. Today we look at our life and think about the guardrails you have put in through your word and maybe our parents have taught us and maybe some mentor or teacher has encouraged us to look at them. I pray that you would help each one of us and if we need to mend some guardrails, you'd help us to do it. And where there are boundaries set, help us not to get so inquisitive that we, we just blow through them and, and become a Judah. Help us, Lord, to, to become a Joseph and to walk with the integrity that you offer. Forgive those that are confessing sin just now. And Lord, I pray for healing of physical bodies this morning, that you would remember those that are just physically just drooping and hurting. Would you remember them today? Would you lift their tired hearts and their tired minds and their tired bodies, touch lungs, touch hearts, touch blood? Lord, touch intestines, touch brain. Lord, I pray that you would touch organs of the body. You would just right now feel you're, you're doing something somewhere. Just do it. Receive honor to your own name. Help our friends with this relief effort down south. Be with them, Lord, and help each of us to do what you want us to do in this life while you give us a chance. Help us not to grumble and gripe. Help us not to criticize the church, which is your bride, but to join in and be the best we can be and add value and not take it away. In your name I pray, amen.